Good afternoon. My name is Bob Perry. I'd like to welcome you to our home and garden in Claremont, California. I'm a landscape architect and a person who thoroughly enjoys plants and look forward to the opportunity to share with you things about our gardens and plants that I find fascinating. And I'm going to begin with pointing to one of my favorite California native manzanita shrubs, which is the Howard McMinn manzanita. It frames a lot of our front garden area here and is one of those plants that we have discovered uh, is highly adaptable to our garden conditions and a never ending source of interest, whether from bark or foliage or flowers or the attraction to pollinator insects and birds. So uh, this is a garden that we've enjoyed for the last 30 years working on and assembling. It's gone through many iterations and has evolved in a variety of ways. Uh, the front yard was intended to be California native, but it certainly has migrated past that. And I can only point to this wonderful Fercredia McDougalli to have you, have you understand that uh, we like plants of all different types and sizes. And this native to Mexico, known as McDougal's century plant, is one of uh, the more striking plants in the neighborhood and certainly in our garden. But it's not to be outdone by other favorites such as the California buckeye. So I challenge you to find many buckeyes in Southern California gardens and urban settings. And yet uh, our interest in California natives has led us to include this tree in our front garden, liking it for its flowers, its shade, its deciduous habit. Uh, it's a very dynamic and seasonally different personality in the garden. What you're seeing in the front yard here uh, once started out as turf grass and an ash tree and has evolved into pretty much a native California landscape with a few additions over the years that add diversity and uh, take it away from being totally California native. But as we walk through and we look at some of the plants that we have planted for the last 20, 25 years, uh, we have a number of the Arctostaphylus densiflora Howard McMinn, uh, commonly known as the McMinn manzanita, one of the most garden tolerant of our coastal manzanitas from central coastal California, and one that uh, if I scan around, you can see several large plants now uh, spreading 10 to 12 feet wide, 6 to 8 feet tall, and uh, these have just recently finished their winter flowering cycle. So they help uh, create some structure to the front yard. And uh, then there are several plants that add punctuation and special interests. And I'll begin with one of my favorite plants that uh, came along just uh, about 10 years ago. And you can see by its size, this Fucrea McDougalli, uh, McDougal's century plant from Mexico. Uh, is a spectacular tall cactus type plant that, uh, hello, hello, that uh, will actually grow up to 20 feet tall, eventually flower. It's monocarpic and meaning it will die after it flowers. It has a large yucca like flower, which is pretty spectacular, uh, both in terms of the flower inflorescence as well as just the uh, shape and character and mass of the plant itself. Before I go any further, I want you to know that I'm definitely uh, a person who has spent time uh, exploring plants, trying to learn about them in a variety of ways. And one of the things that I take away from my observation of the California flora and flora from around the world is that nature works towards abundance and diversity. So in this regard, our gardens really do embrace the idea of having a lot of diversity and achieving something that feels abundant uh, as it matures and fills in. 
So past that, uh, you'll see that abundance and diversity theme wherever we go in our garden. And would like to walk a little bit further forward and look towards the Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, which is one of my favorite California native buckwheats, Eriogonum arborescens. And it's just beginning to flower, and hopefully you can get a pretty good sight on the pinkish color to the flowers in contrast with the pale gray-green leaves. Wonderful color combination, uh, adding a uh, soft touch in the garden without being over the top garish and abrupt. Adjacent to it, a plant that uh, when you study uh, lines, forms, colors, and textures, this Dazzlerion longissimum, the Mexican grass tree, is among the best when it comes to bringing striking form and line into the garden. Uh, a symmetrical mound, as you can see, but comprised of many very long linear arching leaves a plant that will eventually flower like a yucca, but it is not monocarpic. It will flower and continue to grow. And while this has been here for 20 years, uh, over time it will actually develop a small trunk and take on a bit of a palm-like appearance. Hovering above it is a California black oak, Quercus calogii, a plant that grows in our native mountains at 5,000 feet and higher. It loves snow, cold winters, good moisture, and it's still probably wondering why I planted it down here in Claremont. And that's really a good question. It's a plant that's challenged to grow well, be happy in the summer heat that we have, and yet in my efforts to have diversity again and do something that's just not the typical front yard tree, I planted two of these trees, and uh, they are slow growing down here, but adding a bit of interest and character that you normally do not see in residential urban gardens. Perhaps in the background behind this Arctostaphylus densiflora Howard McMinn, you can see another of the Fucrea McDougalli, and uh, a couple of bulblets that I or bulbils that I collected from Santa Barbara campus, UC Santa Barbara, and uh, just planted them in the garden, and voila, they are happy here and growing uh, really successfully. Moving forward, I want to show you a tree that's also not common in urban landscapes, residential gardens. It's our native buckeye, Aesculus californica. And we're seeing it at that stage where the flowers are just completing and they're turning brown and there are some small seed pods beginning to emerge. And uh, it's a tree that uh, we will find in our foothill areas surrounding the uh, Central Valley and then up along the coastal ranges. And we collected a seed from Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, now known as the California Botanic Garden. And uh, after 12 years now, it has grown into this wonderful shade tree that uh, provides us with the springtime flowers. And when it goes deciduous in the winter, we enjoy it for its relatively white bark and pleasing branch structure. So a uh, plant that we enjoy very much for how we found it or got the seed, planted it, and having it growing as a specimen tree in the front yard garden. Walking forward, we now come towards the entry of our home, and what this allows me to do is to look right and left and show you that closer to the home, we have a bit of a microclimate occurring due to the height of the house and the shade that it projects. And so in this regard, I want to say that Part of how we have a lot of diversity in our garden is to understand that we have a lot of different microclimates. We can vary the irrigation, we can amend the soils differently, and all of these things you learn to modify provide opportunities for plants. And so coming to an area where there's more shade in the uh, year-round part of this garden, we will find 
a Circe's Oxidant Talus that is adding additional shade. It's just finished leafing out after its spring flower cycle and it produces a wonderful filtered light, uh, a canopy that's delicate and not heavy like uh, other darker green, thicker leaf foliage plants. What I'd point out is this leaf structure and character is adapted to shaded conditions with moisture pretty much throughout the year. Deciduous trees, riparian trees, they are best adapted in most cases to good organic soils, a loamy type condition, regular moisture, and they have these large thin leaves that just simply grow very quickly, harvesting the sunlight, but needing the moisture to cool their foliage. In this regard, would point out, uh, as we look at how plants use water and whether you're drought adapted, such as the McMinn manzanita here, or less drought adapted as the Western redbud, we will find that 98 to 99% of the moisture that either of these plants use is used for transpiration to cool their foliage and to be able to withstand the heat in the atmosphere. It's not for growing. So these plants need to find a way to offset the heat in the atmosphere and they do so by transpiring on a regular basis. Well, a large thin leaf like the Western red bud can do this very well as long as it has water. And in the later summer months, if that water's not available, the leaves turn yellow, a bit brown, they release and drop, and the tree endures the dry season going semi-deciduous or suffering a bit of foliage damage. A companion plants to the uh, western redbud includes such plants as our mahonias or berberus. In this case we have I think a wonderful specimen here of berberus pinata which comes from our coastal islands and is a fabulous let's say barrier plant that protects the entry to the doorway, the window behind, and is also highly adapted to the shaded conditions and the additional moisture that's provided in this garden. Moving past the Berberus and coming over here to look at other ground cover varieties, we have Berberus repens and find that this is one of the best spreading shrubs, small shrub type plants for shaded conditions that brings wonderful golden yellow flowers in the spring, blueberry fruit that birds will eat when it matures, and otherwise just has a very fresh and green foliage character. Hopefully you can see just by the color of the foliage of all these plants right here, the darker green absorbs more sunlight and in a warm Mediterranean climate they do best when they get some shade and relief from that bright sun, particularly the hot afternoon sun conditions that will burn and stress these plants, particularly if there isn't uh, enough moisture. I want to pan upwards and have us look at a wonderful specimen of our native toyon. This happens to be the Davis Gold variety, Heteromeles arbutifolia Davis Gold, coming from our offshore islands. It's now in its flowering stage, so it's flowering late spring, and by oh, late fall, early winter, the berries that develop will ripen into a golden orange yellow color and provide for a number of bird species berries and fruit in the late spring of the following year when that fruit has ripened and uh, becomes edible by these birds. It's become a wonderful corner anchor plant to our home landscape framing the house and helping to reduce the overall presence 
of uh, the house, which is rather boxy and rectangular in shape. So I'm going to move back to another part of the front yard, but before doing so, I want to stand on our front porch and look towards the north and uh, comment on the idea of feng shui where we have our San Gabriels hidden behind our neighbor's oak trees in the background. But the energy and the mass that these mountains represent are interpreted to flow to the south from the high points of those mountains to the lower valley areas. And the way to bring it into your home is to have it come in in a curvilinear and gracious way, not a straight walkway, but a walkway that meanders and invites people to have a bit of mystery and to see the entry around a point in the curve of the sidewalk. So early on in the design of this garden, our thought was to embrace that concept and to take the energy that flows from the high elevations to the low elevations and to sweep it into the home without being so abrupt and so brutal as a straight walkway uh, that was once here. Going over to another part of the front yard, we have another shade garden. I uh, want to point out that we have an Asclepius here, silky gold. Um, this is a butterfly bush and probably in a bit more shade than it does best, but it is thriving here and recently planted, so we're hopeful to continue to add to the attraction of butterflies and uh, pollinator insects into the garden, uh, along with, as you can see very clearly here, our regular use of leaf litter mulch. Now, a lot of this comes from our Petosterum undulatum, spectacular overhead canopy tree that comes from Australia. And we find that uh, after a number of years, it has beautiful structure to a number of these leaves still burn that the uh, foliage tires out and the moisture uh, still cannot be transpired fast enough. And so this tree does get damaged like Japanese maples or even Western red buds when we don't put them in a shaded enough environment. One of my favorite plants that's uh, getting better and better each year, California native here, are Ribes sanguinium variety glutinosum. And in this regard, this Ribes uh, is one that produces these wonderful long tassels of pink and white flowers during the springtime. It clearly is also a microclimate plant needing shelter and some shade uh, from the hot sun so we don't plant it out in the front garden area. We plant it here where we can enjoy its beauty from the windows behind as well as to protect it with shade from the home and additional irrigation through our drip irrigation system. So we really enjoy having this plant uh, that uh, during the summertime finds uh, it a bit stressed, but other than uh, that cycle, which is common, uh, it's a plant well adapted here to our garden. I'm going to take you into the first of uh, rooms as we call them. Nothing uh, spectacular, but a quiet, secluded, sequestered space with a canopy of the dogwood overhead and a small garden wall to create a sense of enclosure and space, punctuated with a planter with aeoniums and agaves, which we'll talk about later couple of chairs for my wife and myself. Uh, another potted plant with Cycus revoluta, a sago palm. And behind the sago palm is another Arctostaphylus densiflora, Howard McMinn. 
And then one more plant here, a plant that I thoroughly enjoy for its wild habit, its free spirit, as I call it, its propensity to grow as it wants to grow, particularly when it's in a container, uh, commonly known as elephant food, Portulacaria afra from southern Africa uh, in hot and dry climate zones and conditions. So the succulence of this foliage enables the stems and the leaves to store moisture and to use that moisture should we not water it enough during the summer months. And at this point though, I think what we see uh, to my enjoyment is a plant that really is, as I say, free spirited. Uh, at times I get tired of plants that are also predictable, also uniform, also repetitive in character. And um, part of my interest in collecting plants and showing plants is to have the full range of adaptations, forms, characteristics, and uh, once again, illustrate that this plant that would grow in semi-arid desert type environments can adapt to a container, grow in partial shade, and uh, adapt just fine if you know how to care for it. So we have this view, and if I sit down for a moment and look out towards the sidewalk, we can sit here, have a glass of wine, or in my case, I enjoy beer, and we can say hello to people if they look our way and see us sitting in here, or we can just simply enjoy looking at the people walking by and being part of the neighborhood. Spaces like this too, this is on the east side of our home, and with a western onshore breeze that happens in the afternoon, we're in a wonderfully sheltered space. So you're seeing a little bit of leaf movement now based on the ambient uh, air currents of the morning temperatures. But later in the afternoon, the onshore breezes that do extend this far inland uh, come sweeping across our property. And this is a wonderful small room uh, to sit in and be sheltered from those stronger breezes. So as I continue to walk around and just uh, look at our garden, I want to point out a uh, senna tree that is a butterfly magnet. And hopefully as I walk around to the other side, uh, this particular species, I believe it's senna speciosa, uh, produces clusters of yellow flowers and we're going to see just a small beginning of these flowers and the attraction to one of our indigenous sulfur butterflies. So they just love this plant and uh, you get to a point at times where you say, if I want fragrance in the garden, I'm gonna use Osmanthus fragrance. If I want butterflies in the garden, I'll use Senna speciosa and a small tree that can be managed as a large shrub or a standard plant. But by and large, when the flowers start to open, we will have hundreds of butterflies swarming this plant and enjoying every bit of the foliage and the flowers uh, for the caterpillars as well as the nectar. So back around, we see our beautiful Fucraea McDougalli again, and uh, perhaps you can see a bit of the stout yucca-like base that it's producing, and uh, just the abrupt and striking architectural form that it presents in the garden. Certainly to many neighbors, they, they're sort of wondering uh, why we chose this plant. And uh, I just have to tell you, I like its size, its mass, and feel like it is uh, unique in the urban landscape.
would like to comment on a few more plants out in the front sunnier portion of the garden. And in addition to the Arctostaphylus densiflora Howard McMinn, we have another wonderful garden adapted manzanita with pale green foliage, much larger foliage shape, uh, a large shrub too, uh, with the beautiful mahogany red bark. This is Arctostaphylus Dr. Hurd. Um, it's a manzanita cultivar, so you could say Arctostaphylus manzanita, quote, Dr. Hurd. So explorers would go out into our native landscape and they would look at many different varieties of native plants. They would see differences among them. And when it came to Arctostaphylus manzanita, which some people say is the flagship species of that genus, there was a challenge to find a plant that they could propagate and that would grow successfully in gardens. And over time, this particular selection, the Dr. Hurd selection, uh, was discovered, was tested, and was embraced as the best garden choice for a large manzanita, pale green foliage again, and uh, useful for residential settings. Further out in the driest part of the landscape, just coming into flower, is a, another sage plant. This is Salvia allen chickering, and uh, commonly known as either allen chickering sage or fragrant sage. And if you were to crush the foliage here, you will find it has a really sweet, fragrant uh, quality about it. And it's just fabulous when you either trim it or brush by it and have the oils in the leaves uh, release that fragrance. I mentioned oils in the leaves saying that some of the survival strategies of these drought adapted plants uh, come from the oils that are within the cell structure of the leaves helping the foliage to hold on to moisture and not transpire it entirely to the atmosphere. Even at that, even with the oils that help conserve moisture in the foliage of some of our native sage plants, they're very well known as being drought deciduous so that by the end of summer, under great moisture stress in both natural and urban landscapes, the leaves start to dry and to fall off and to uh, release in order to conserve moisture. Leaves are the biggest moisture losing pieces of plants or parts of plants. And in this regard, the leaves get sacrificed in order to avoid transpiring and losing moisture, allowing that moisture to stay in the stems and the roots. And once the winter rains begin, those roots and stems can regenerate new leaves and also go through the flowering cycle. So interesting ways that plants adapt to circumstances of moisture and drought. And in this case, the sage plant has oils in the leaves, but furthermore, uh, will share, sacrifice those leaves in order to conserve the moisture in the stems and roots to get through the long, hot and dry summer. So standing back and looking at the garden from the west side and looking from the first Kellogg oak or black oak, Quercus Kelloggii, above our Arctostaphylus, dense, our Arctostaphylus manzanita, Dr. Hurd, and another Fucrea McDougalli over to, we can see our western redbud against the house, and furthermore, we'll see the Heteromeles arbutifolia variety Davis Gold uh, anchoring the corner of the house. We can look at two other plants while we're on this side of the garden and point out a euphorbia. Uh, so many, so many varieties and species of euphorbia. This happens to be rigida, uh, the spurge that uh, has such spectacular bluish foliage color 
uh, a nice rosette structure to the foliage on the greenish stems and uh, the chartreuse yellow green flowering that the stems produce every spring. Uh, one of the smaller euphorbias and one that I find in a water conservation garden adds special interest and visual character among the other plants. Succulents bring a, a type of structure, uniformity, uh, and quality that uh, often is a nice complement to the more natural characteristics of other shrubs. And talking about natural and going a bit wild, we now are seeing our Matillaha poppy, Romnia coulteri, going into its summer deciduous state and it is quickly shedding its leaves and stems turning brown and all the flowers are long gone now so the seed pods are being developed and uh, at this point if we look at it in the garden it starts to add a bit of the wild random natural uh, character which if it's too much for you uh, you can choose to cut the stems off to the base at the ground and they will regrow starting in the fall and come out with pleasing foliage character and habit and you don't have to put up with what some people consider to be scruffy and unattractive. Hopefully you can also see uh, threaded through here is the drip tubing that we have that weaves its way around and uh, skims by plants that don't need a lot of water but circle around plants uh, with two or three loops for the trees that need the water. And in that regard, uh, we find that we can have plants with different water needs growing well together. So this is pretty much the overview of our front garden area. Hope that you've enjoyed looking at the walkways, the spaces, the diversity of plants that we have with me pointing out and commenting on uh, the more significant ones. We're going to go down through the driveway to the backyard and enter into a series of other garden spaces and rooms.